thank you. It's a, it's a real privilege and honor to be here sitting between two women who I admire so tremendously uh, for all of their hard work for social justice and their many accomplishments. And we have a, a lot to talk about today, and I, I think we're all eager to hear from all of you. And so we'll keep our introductory remarks kind of open-ended, but not uh, all the way to our 5 p.m. Um, <laughs> stopping point, which we could easily do. Uh, but you know, if we want to think about this program as part of the 1968 series, you know, here we are in a moment in our country that maybe most of us in this room might not have anticipated just a few years back. And if we think about the long half century since the turmoil of the 1960s that seemed to culminate with a lot of changes in the culture and politics of the United States, particularly the rights revolutions surrounding you know, civil rights for African Americans and other racial minorities, the feminist movement, uh, the gay and lesbian movement, all of those um, all of, all of those movements churning in the late 60s and, and 70s that seem to kind of open things up in new ways. And we find ourselves right now in a very challenging time. Um, and so um, I'd, I'd like us to kind of talk about what those challenges are and, and how they have affected particularly the kind of work uh, that um, both Nancy Gertner and Lucia Brooks uh, have been engaged in over the last several decades. And um, I'd like to start by asking Leisha to talk a little bit about the Southern Poverty Law Center. Some of you may be very familiar with the center and its work, and some of you may not know a lot about what they do. Um, but um, to, to explain a little bit about the center and what you do there and, and how you see the um, particular challenges that have emerged recently. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> thank In five you. minutes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So um, happy to. Or more than five. No, no, no. Just, just <laughs> cut me off when it's time. Um, thank you all for coming. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk with you, and I, I, I look forward to hearing your questions as well. A little brief history of the Southern Poverty Law Center. We were founded in 1971. So that is kind of in the context of your whole series on 1968. If we look at kind of the long arc of the civil rights movement beginning in 1964 with Brown v. Board through 68, assassination of Dr. King, that's what most people mark as the modern American civil rights movement. There was tremendous, there was a lot, there was a lot going on. And we got some tremendous gains relative to civil and human rights in 1964 with the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And then, as you may know, I hope you do know, that Dr. King went on to look at issues around poverty and was then assassinated in 68. We had some um, tremendous political upheaval in 1968. And then there in, in Montgomery, Alabama, there's a man named Morris Dees who grew up on a farm um, and was born and raised during the Jim Crow era, I think it's important to note, along with, um, they weren't friends at the time, but Joe Levin, who went on to become the, the founders of the Southern Poverty Law Center. Now, I, I really want to underscore that point that they were born and raised during the Jim Crow era in Montgomery, Alabama. So I think it's very significant. They saw, though, and noted, and were really moved and inspired by what happened around them during the Civil Rights Movement. It's also important to note that they didn't participate in the Civil Rights Movement at all. Morris didn't go to marches. Joe, Joe didn't either. They, they came to their awakening around these issues a little later. But in 71, when they saw that Montgomery had changed and it felt like the country was going to change, they had just finished uh, law school at U University of Alabama, and they started a civil rights law firm, very small. They wanted to continue the, well, really ensure that the sacrifices that were made by regular everyday people in pushing forward civil rights legislation, that they became a reality. They were from Alabama, so they knew that it didn't necessarily 
followed that that Alabama was going to you know honor the Civil Rights Act of 1964 or the Voting Rights Act. So their initial thing was just suing, litigating, litigating, litigating against the state for refusing to honor the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act. And so there were a lot of cases like that. Um, because of that period in time, the work that they did, and both white, they were seen as kind of race traders, and the Klan, who were you know prominent from the 20s through through the 80s, at, in, in a strong way in Alabama, started um, following Morris really closely and firebombed our offices. You know, there were death threats and all of this. But they killed a person named Michael Donald, a 19-year-old black man who lived in Mobile, Alabama, in 1981, lynched him from a tree, and Morris decided that we should sue the Klan. It had never been done before. So took the Klan to court, civil court, and um, seven years late, later won a $7 million judgment against the Klan, a Klan organization. So that is what kind of catapulted the Southern Poverty Law Center into the world of hate and extremism. So we're still doing civil rights litiga litigation, but then also developing this project that tracked and monitored and then now sued hate and extremist groups. Fast forward, we've probably had about 15, 16 major cases against um, groups like the Klan, Aryan Nation, White Aryan Resistance not just in the South, but really in other places, notably in the Pacific Northwest. And um, it becomes part of our brand. A few years later, 1991, we add a project called Teaching Tolerance that is designed to provide free anti-bias curriculum to K-12 educators. Back then, it was called multicultural, um, edu multicultural diversity um, materials or resources for teachers. So now we have this three-pronged, kind of three-legged program area. Civil rights litigation, tracking and monitoring hate and extremism, and free anti-bias curriculum for K-12 teachers. The thought with the, with the curriculum was is that what we noticed in the lawsuits is that a lot of young people were committing these heinous acts. So we thought, let's find a way to, to get their attention and get them to appreciate and celebrate diversity before they became susceptible to messages of hate and hatred. So that's kind of how we got to be where we are today. So the issues then were very similar to what the issues are now. I was sharing with someone over lunch that I don't believe that we've seen such open, racist mm, policies um, policies and actions by the the administration or people kind of you know even going back to the to the uh, presidential campaign we haven't seen this kind of uh, hate rhetoric since George Wallace quite frankly and and it's just true it's not it's not partisan we just track and follow hate and extremism <laughs> and and it's taken us to the White House so we followed and played, paid close attention to um, the people that are associated within the Trump campaign, you know, Steve Bannon, Steve Miller, uh, Gorkic, uh, Gorka, not Gorsuch, sorry, <laughs> Gorka, Sebastian Gorka, who, you know, has relationships with neo Nazis in, in Austria, and, and, and anyway, it goes, the list goes on and on. There was an uptick in hate, hate crimes and hate group activity post-election, immediately following the election. There was, an, there was um, we, can, we can track our research shows uh, an emboldenment on, on, on behalf of, on the, on the part of people who hold biased and bigoted thoughts, whether they be associated, directly associated with a hate group or not. There was just kind of this, this sea change relative to how people were acting out their, their bias and bigotry. So it became okay. To um, to say whatever they want and create you know kind of um, engage in anti-Semitic, anti-Black, anti-LGBT kind of things. So we thought that was bad. So we watched it, we monitored, try to make people aware of what was going on. And now we're in a space where we're still um, tracking the the growth in hate groups. Not only the growth growth in hate groups in the physical sense, 
but also in the online space, there's been a tremendous um, growth there as well. Case in point would be Dylan Roof, who massacred nine African Americans in Charleston, South Carolina, without ever going to a meeting. You know, he wasn't, he didn't, he wasn't a Klan member. He didn't, he, he associated with no one other than the people that he met online or what he read online. So we've been kind of watching that, and now we're, we are concerned about that, but I think most concerning to us, and to your question, is how the policies that represented what white nationalists wanted for so long are now being carried out at the federal level by this, by this administration. So now kind of hate, hate and extremist groups have an administration that will put into place very xenophobic, you know, and in particular anti-Mexican anti policies around immigration, um, this, this pushback against um, the advancement of, of LGBT rights. Um, we're seeing the whole kind of revisiting bathroom bills. Oh, let, let me say happy National Coming Out Day. Um, today's National Coming Out Day. You know, it, it, yeah, you clap for it now because it may be gone. I mean, um, the way these policies are, are, are moving, it will literally push you know, children, at least younger people, back into the closet. We've made, ex we've made extensive gains on that on that front. So again, to answer your question and stop, the most pressing issues, I guess, for us are just kind of trying to push back against these white nationalist policies or at the very least point out that, they're, um, that they reflect the, the, the thoughts, beliefs, and wishes of white nationalists like, you know, white supremacists like David Duke. Secondly, there's, we're, we're tremendously concerned about what's happening to um, people who are asylum seekers, you know, people who are seeking uh, immigration status or, you know, just the whole kind of anti-immigrant movement. We're very concerned about that. We're concerned about how we're treating people in detention facilities and are putting a lot of resources in that area in terms of uh, advocacy and, and legal support. So those are the kind of the big things that are facing us in addition to kind of the regular um, legal work that my colleagues do on on all fronts, on all civil rights fronts. Sorry, it wasn't very upbeat, but mm -hmm. there you have it. This is a very hard week <laughs> to be upbeat. Um, yeah. We've been talking over the last day and a half, and it's kind of boiled down to uh, whatever the question is, the answer is Kavanaugh. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> and, um, you know, take it away. Th is there a question in there? <laughs> you yes. know the answer. Oh, right, right. <laughs> Well, I just wanted to follow up what Alicia was sure. talking about. So, in, so I was in law school. I was in Yale Law School between 68 and 71, just to start with the theme of the day. And um, I, I, ha I have to say this. Um, I, I was not in class a lot, not because I, like Judge Kavanaugh, was drinking, <laughs> just to say that. I was mostly demonstrating. We had a very different experience of Yale Law School. And the, I had gone to law school anticipating that I was I'd gone to graduate school first, then I went to law school, and I anticipated that I would be an academic. Um, but I was completely swept away by the movements that Leisha is talking about. Mm -hmm. So that it was anti-Vietnam War, uh, it was the civil rights movement, it was the women's rights movement. Mm -hmm. And suddenly my uh, career took a turn, because I suddenly wanted to use the skills that I was learning at Yale Law School at the service of social change. And I went from, uh, and I, you know, I be, that's what I did for the next uh, 24 years. I was a civil rights lawyer, I was a criminal defense lawyer. My work was, I was in a private law firm, but my work was largely structured around, uh, around essentially being a lawyer for social change. I want to pause for a moment. So on the one hand, one legacy of that time is a model for social engagement. Mm -hmm. All of us being socially engaged. What it's like to be a lawyer involved in social change, what it's like to be politicians focused on social change, ordinary citizens. So that there, that is a model of engagement. And it was, a, I have to admit, um, it was a tremendously heady time. I didn't come from an activist family. I was telling, I was telling Elaine last night, I mean, I have these wonderful stories. My parents, if anything, were horrified at what I was 
doing, I came back from the first time I marched against the war, marched down Fifth Avenue. It was the first time I ever did anything you know, dramatically anti-establishment. We marched, this is before law school, marched down Fifth Avenue. I come home to my father and mother, and I say, guess what I did today? My father launches into this tirade. We get, have a huge fight, and his parting words were classic. His ending words were classic. He says, Nance, it's one thing to believe in something. It's quite another thing to do something about it. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, that became my mantra. I had every intention of doing something about it. But the story of the 60s, actually, uh, of 68, has, there's, a, there's a downside to it, which is although much was accomplished in terms of legislation, in terms of litigation, it also, the so-called dislocations of the mm. 60s, became the justification for harsh sentencing policy 10 years later. I mean, one of the reasons for mandatory minimums and what became uh, mass incarceration was the sense that there was social dislocation and the government had to clamp down on it. So that's another cautionary tale here, to sort of recognize that there is a reaction, not on the merits, but a reaction to the fact of disruption. Mm -hmm. And you see that now. Um, uh, after I went to, to law school, and as I said, I was a civil rights and a criminal defense lawyer for the next 24 years, um, I uh, had no intention of being a judge. I thought my career was completely uh, you know, um, likely to be impossible given where I started to become a judge. Um, uh, there's a funny story I love to tell about Justice Sotomayor and me. We were at a Yale Law School meeting. The women wanted to know, how does one become a judge? And she says, you go to this fine law school, you do well, you work for the government, you have political opinions, but you're cautious about how you reflect them and you become a judge. Then it was my turn. I said, you go to this fine school, you clerk for a judge, uh, and then you represent the first lesbian, feminist, radical, revolutionary accused of killing a cop you can find. <laughs> this would be your first case on prime time. You take every abortion case in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, you give speeches on Boston Common. During one speech, I burned my bar card because of some decision or another. <laughs> and for the final coup de grace, you marry the legal director of the American Civil Liberties Union of Massachusetts, and you become a judge. <laughs> uh, so we had a very different trajectory. But then I was, uh, I mean, candidly, Bill Clinton became president. I had gone to law school at the Clintons. Uh, I had never imagined that I could be a judge. Senator Ted Kennedy, who was a remarkable and courageous uh, uh, senator, made me his, his campaign um, and, and helped me uh, become confirmed as a federal judge. For the next 17 years, I would hope that none of you do the math here. I was, I was four when I went to <laughs> law school. Um, uh, for the next 17 years, I was a federal judge. But I was a federal judge having been this other person having been a civil rights lawyer and a criminal defense lawyer. And so what we talked about at the law school today was what that perspective, um, uh, how, how that perspective shaped my judging. And it shaped my judging in the sense that when, as I said this morning, when I sentenced um, defendants to, I sentenced numbers of defendants, mostly African American, mostly of drug offenses, to sentences which I believed at the time and believe even more today were wildly unfair, disproportionate, and unjust. And essentially, for the next 17 years, I had to operate at two levels at once. One was my, my personal feelings about what I was doing, and the other was what I had to do. Uh, you, you know, as a judge, you take an oath, and you have to, you, 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 if, you, if you're not prepared to carry out the law, you can't be a judge. But I was constantly measuring what I was doing by what I thought was right and what I thought was fair and where possible tried to bring the two uh, together. The, what we have witnessed this week with the uh, confirmation of, just, of Judge Justice Kavanaugh, I can't even say the word, <laughs> um, is, um, is horrifying um, on just about every level. I mean, the irony is Senator Kennedy had to work very hard to get me to be a judge because of where I had come from. Um, and I spent the next 17 years learning what moving to neutral in some way, which is what judging is about. Um, the president, with respect to the, to the nomination of Kavanaugh, was unabashed 
at what he was doing, what he was trying to do, um, which is to put someone on the bench, not just Roe v. Wade, and not just LGBT rights, mm -hmm. and not just affirmative action, but this is literally a, a judge who, um, I'm writing a piece called The Undoing Project, who wishes to reverse the, the, the regulatory state, the administrative state, literally reverse the legislation, health, safety, welfare, discrimination uh, uh, that, that, that came about during the Great Society and uh, the New Deal. In other words, his doctrines challenge government power in lots of ways. And if his doctrines become established doctrines for the Supreme Court, much more will be at risk than people um, understand. Um, so it, it's a, um, where does that leave me? Uh, it, it leaves me uh, about as far from being retired as any human being in the world can be. Um, I'm teaching and writing. I occasionally appear on television if they have enough makeup. Um, uh, uh, you know, and uh, doing a little bit of litigation. Um, I don't, th there was a saying when, when I was a kid I imagine was not a you know brilliant saying, but which is that if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. I think that applies to all of us now. There is no, no one can be a passive observer in these days. Whatever your politics are, no one can be a passive observer. So I have no intention of ever retiring. Death is a different matter, but retiring, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, thank you to both of you. Um, for these uh, kind of grim openers, but um, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I should say that at the end of our, uh, we, we had a session earlier today at the law school, and at the end, both of you confessed to having um, some optimism about where we're heading, and um, mm -hmm. I found that really heartening, and I think the idea of all of us, you know, just sort of standing up and moving forward um, is, is really essential. I'd, I'd like to now um, move us toward our open discussion, but maybe with a few comments from our esteemed guests. Um, you know, in 1968, when it seemed as though, uh, among many other things that were going on at the time, by the late 60s, uh, some people at the North were beginning to think, huh, you know, this problem of race and segregation not really just a southern problem, you know, we have, we have some issues we need to deal with in the north. And for some northerners who had always kind of um, pushed this away and said, well, you know, I'm a northerner, this isn't about me, it's about those racist southerners, um, to suddenly start confronting the very obvious reality of racial segregation, racist institutions, racial thinking, you know, all over the country. Um, whether we had Jim Crow laws or not, we still had many of the same issues. And, um, and so what I'd like to do now is maybe kind of uh, take both a, um, a look at time and place. So the time is the span that we're looking at, and the place is not just the north, uh, but Minnesota. And I think Minnesotans have long also had an illusion that somehow Minnesota nice meant that, you know, we don't have these problems here. And recent events have um, uncovered, you know, a lot of things. Some of you may have seen the Campus Divided exhibit at um, Anderson Library last year or the website uh, that shows, you know, really deep problems of um, racism anti-Semitism, um, surveillance of students, um, you know, all, all kinds of, of uh, really terrible things that go way back uh, into the 1930s and 40s and extended past World War II, right here at this institution that had always prided itself in a, in a kind of liberal tolerance um, historical memory. And then, of course, we have had in our own locations Obviously, many issues um, regarding the relationship between police and communities of color. And we've also had a recognition of the, you know, some of you may have heard of or may even be involved 
in the Mapping Prejudice Project that has gone around and actually seen how many um, residences had racial covenants in them that determined who could or could who could buy a, a house when it came for sale and who was prevented, and how that literally mapped across the Twin Cities. And all of these things have sort of opened up the question of, oh, well, you know, we have to kind of examine our own history here um, in Minnesota and how it, uh, you know, how it both reflects and engages with both the, the history that we're looking at and also the efforts to kind of um, reach a, a, a more um, social justice orientation in, in our own location. So I don't know if you two would like to comment about just sort of the, both the specificity of place and time, uh, but also kind of taking the next step that you both mentioned about how we have to, um, you know, we have to not just think about these things, but do something about them, and maybe starting in our own backyard is, uh, mm -hmm. you know, a better way to do it. Well, I appreciate you bringing it, bringing the specificity to it, because oftentimes when I'm asked to talk about the civil rights movement outside of the South, people just like to hear it like it's like history. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's so quaint, you know, and wow, that happens down there. I know Alabama is somewhat of a foreign place, but it's in the United States of America. And so this is what happens here. And it's interesting, I, I don't know a lot about your history, but I do know that there were quite a number of students um, from Minnesota who came down for Freedom Summer in Mississippi. Mm -hmm. And so you also have that, right? And so I think it's important to remember and acknowledge that you have um, historical example of anti-racist white folks in action. And what they did was, they may have thought they were just kind of going down to help and you know, be good white people. What they came away with was an awareness of kind of how racism really plays out. And then they were also um, the recipients of this this negativity, this anger, this hatred. And then they brought that back to, to you know, their communities. And I think, as I understand it, that had something to do with, with your liberal leanings or your progressive leanings, uh, if you want to call them that. That said, if you look at, if you look at the data that describes um, racial disparities, they're pretty consistent and pretty bad quite frankly, uh, Minnesota. <laughs> I mean, we expect Alabama to be bad and Mississippi. But look, look, look at yours. Look at your, you look at your achievement gap um, or your, your record of academic success in terms of K-12 students. Who does well, who doesn't? Or, quite frankly, look around you. See who's here, who's not. Places don't stay majority white for no reason, especially in this time of, uh, of demographic shifts. So I think, I think it's always important to, to look, look at yourself, look, look within, and, and talk to yourselves about how you can make and create and maintain more just communities. Because as you do that in your own community, then the country changes. It's not all about the South. We, we, we need things, but you all need things too because you can then help lead the country. Again, you have some really good things. I love, you know, Congressman Ellison. I think it's, you know, fabulous. Uh, he's he comes to the South every year. Um, so you are you are far and ahead in that regard. But you still, and at the same time, you still have extreme Islamophobia. So I don't know, kind of schizophrenic. The the one um, I kept on thinking during the Trump campaign for a moment about. Um, that the, on the one hand, it was horrifying what was going on, but on the other hand, there was something efficacious about making, imp, make, making things explicit what had formerly been implicit. Mm. That there was something good about not pretending, as we came to pretend in the Obama years, that we were post-racial, or pretending that we were post-gender. Because those attitudes actually percolate into the, into the into court, and so we saw, for example, civil rights cases brought in federal court 
80% of them lose and lose at the judge's stage. The judge doesn't let them go forward. And part of it was a sense that this was no longer a big deal. And Black Lives Matter and Me Too movement and the statements of, of uh, you know, our presidents have made explicit what was implicit and therefore make it easier to organize around. Um, and I think that that's part, of, that every community needs that kind of uh, reawakening. I mean, in Boston there was a, a um, uh, series that the Globe Spotlight TV did on race in Boston. Oh, yeah. Which was horrifying. Mm -hmm. um, you know, where the investments are going, which communities are getting the investments. The seaport area, which is a very new and very fancy area, is overwhelmingly white in a city that actually is, I think it's 25% um, African American. I think the, the majority, the, the, the it's higher than that when you add other minorities. So, that was incredibly helpful. It suggests a different approach mm -hmm. to, to looking at these things. Mm -hmm. In other words, it's not just expecting, although we have seen it with our president, someone saying something blatantly racist. It's also a question of looking and examining patterns after the fact. What are the patterns of arrest? What are the patterns of investment? What, how can it happen that you know all of these subjective and discretionary decisions wind up disadvantaging people of color. Um, and doing that kind of analysis from one end of this country to the other is a good thing. And then mobilizing around it. Mm -hmm. It's not enough to, to say we are bad people. It's something we need to mobilize around. And that's a theme that we keep on coming back to. Mm -hmm. I agree. Well, thank you. I think we should. Oh, I also want to acknowledge and thank our interpreters who are here. Thank you very much for being here. I'd like to open it up now to, um, to all of you. I don't know if we need a circulating mic. It's a pretty good acoustic room. Um, so I just ask that you maybe identify yourself and um, speak up with questions or comments. Yes. There's <laughs> there have we followed anti Semitism? Well look the at Trump administration. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, yes. <laughs> the <laughs> the incidence of well anti Semitism I don't wanna make I don't wanna make light of it. There's been an increase in anti Semitism probably for the last decade. I mean it's a, and it's a global phenomenon. But it really picked up in the US maybe five, six years ago. It's pretty blatant un, uh, under the Trump administration and there's no kind of check on it. I, I, I remember the first, which is, I guess it was just last year, it feels like forever, but the first Holocaust Remembrance Day under the Trump administration, do you remember? He didn't even say the word Jews, right? And so he, he, he wants to throw out his son-in-law, you know, kind of when he wants to get points, but he doesn't really, and this is just my opinion, probably not the opinion of the Southern Poverty Law Center officially. My friends, though, yeah. <laughs> Um, all to say that there's been a tremendous uptick in, in anti-Semitism. And it, the, 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 the President of the United States has this tremendous bully pulpit. And if, if, if he used it properly and called out the anti-Semitism or all of the hate crimes that are happening across the country, maybe they would stop. But because they go un, unanswered, they continue. And that's what happens with, you know, <coughs> might be low-level hate incidents, the, a swastika, here, a swastika there, and now the next thing you know, we have the desecration of Jewish cemeteries all over the country. And I have yet to hear him say anything about that. And, and these, are, these are signs of, of, of real problems. I mean, the, the swastika, as you know, is a, is a symbol of Nazi Germany. Or the fact that, that you know, the, the white nationalists who marched through Charlottesville shouting, Jews will not replace us and blood and soil, other neo-Nazi kind of terminology, and, and he, would, he would have us believe that you know, there, were, there were good people in that group. These, these were Nazis, right? So, and it wasn't, it's, it's not that they're just anti-black or anti-immigrant, um, they are, they are anti-Jewish too. And yeah, I wish that, I wish that he would speak out about it. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a real problem. And I would just add again that 
that it's something that's happening globally. And so we need to speak out universally um, about it. My name's Leisha. <laughs> it's tougher for sure. It's tougher for sure. We've come, come under direct attack with this administration. Not so much Trump. Pence, Vice President Pence, who flies under the, the, the radar. He's also kind of, you know, far-right extremist on the religious side. And the Southern Poverty Law Center, maybe seven, eight years ago, started identifying groups as anti-LGBT. And he and his friend, like the Family Research Council, Tony Perkins, who, uh, who by his own admission gushes about being invited at the, to the White House more than, than he's ever ever has been, um, Pence just spoke at a at a you know anti LGBT conference, and so he's trying to help them push back against our label of them as a hate group. That's what's happening there. The decision not to prosecute? Yeah. Officer, right. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I, don't know where to, I don't know where to begin. I mean, the problem, I don't agree. Um, uh, the, the, the system is, um, there are so many problems with charging police officers that begin with the problem of prosecutors making decisions predicting what juries will do. And then there are problems of what juries will do because those predictions are often true. I mean, the latest conviction is extraordinarily oh, unusual yeah. um, uh, because the standard for a jury, a jury to deal with, you know, was a reason was a police officer reasonably uh, reasonable apprehension of danger, and we we feed into that all of our stereotypes. I mean, we're just reading on the way here of a young man. Who, who missed the bus and went to a, a, fam, a house, and when he opened the door, he was shot. It was He was black and they were white. So he, he, all of the legal doctrines that have to do with, you know, what's a reasonable apprehension of danger, what is reasonable in, for, in, in terms of self-defense, we read racism and stereotypes into what comprises reasonableness. Mm -hmm. And so prosecutors then are predicting that's what juries will do. So. That, that is, a, uh, to some degree, a legal change, but it's also going to take a societal change, um, which is that you can't generalize about people in the way these, these um, are involved. The, the, the Trump administration has now pulled back from all of the, there were numbers of police departments that were being investigated for institutional racism, and that was another way to address this. You're not addressing this individual cop who was, you know, you say he was aberrant or not, but addressing a police department that is regularly making uh, search, search decisions or arrest decisions that are race-based and look at that. Now, the Trump administration pulled back from that, pull, pulled back from consent decrees in Chicago and other places. So that's another way of addressing it. Um, and I think the, the, the third way is it's not federal prosecutors. State prosecutors are elected. They should be thrown out of office. Uh, for these kinds of decisions. Uh, one question about uh, the rules and details of campaigns and so forth. Uh, in my case, we have a position where they can ask me to run a campaign and so on. But are they required to tell me what that will be? For example, in, in World War I, the Queen Mother spoke to the Lord of the Rings. Right. Even though what they were doing before, right. Right. 
Okay, we're going to get one. And if the person says thank you, you just hold your hand. And the thank you, the person who wants to talk is convicted of bribing you and going to the person who wants to get the Fine, backbone. <laughs> That's a long problem. That's a, that's a, so you, you raise two issues. I mean, in times of, there, there's no question that, um, you know, beginning with the Alien and Sedition Acts, that um, uh, Congress has passed legislation that implicates First Amendment issues. And up until the, I, I may get the dates on 30s and 40s, that we actually did not have a very robust First Amendment argument to address that. Um, even when the First Amendment had, was more robust, you still have things like the Spock prosecution, et cetera. Um, the danger today is that there's not a declared war and that national security concerns become the justification for everything. Um, uh, you know, it, it's, it, it's, it's a complicated issue because, um, um, because judges should enforce the Constitution regardless of what, not regardless of taking into account national security issues, but recognizing that we can't win wars by sacrificing our values. That that, while you take it into account, it cannot, one cannot, I hate to use this verb, trump the other. Um, so I, I do think that that's a problem. I think if time, t declared times of war are particularly bad, but the Cold War and national security concerns are, are a problem as well. Um, but, but the, the bench is a particular problem. Um, and I, and I'm, I will say this out loud everywhere I go. It is not the case that the Democrats have done what the Republicans have done. It is not the case that the Democrats have put zealots on the bench, you know, or even progressives on the bench. I'm happy to say that I actually was an exception. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm happy to say that I was a progressive. I'm not happy to say that, I, that other people like me were not on the bench. The Democrats put Merrick Garland, or proposed Merrick Garland, and proposed people who are um, moderates and therefore are not likely to stand up in these kinds of situations that you're describing. The Republicans, uh, particularly under Trump, are putting partisans on the bench, are putting a very different kind of judge. It's not equivalent at all. There, there is no Democratic equivalent of Robert Bork who did not believe that the 14th Amendment applied to women. There is no democratic equivalent of that. So part of the problem here is that up until recently, even the Republicans were putting moderates, Democrats were putting moderates on the bench, and those are not necessarily judges that will stand up on national security or, or war issues. They're more likely to defer to the government. Um, uh, Trump is putting very different people on who are very likely to defer uh, to the government and not stand up for First Amendment issues. There's a broader constitutional issue, which, um, which is that, you know, there's a whole, the body of law that you're talking about is a body of law that is deferred to the government in these times. It's one thing to defer to a government that is rational, that is, uh, uh, you know, doing what it's doing after studying and careful analysis. It's quite another thing to defer to this president and his decision making. Uh, so far, the district courts have not been deferring. So far, but who knows what the trickle-down effect would be of a new Supreme Court. But it's a, it's a genuine problem. You know, it's a problem for every country. Uh, it, it's not just an American uh, problem. Um, you know, judges, judges, and na judges don't know what to do when national security concerns are whispered in their ear. Uh, so it's not, it's not an easy situation, but it was certainly made worse in the U.S. by 9-11, by the, the concerns about national security in an undeclared war, and by the kinds of people that we typically put on the bench.
I don't even know where to begin with that. I mean, I, I feel if I if I if I counted on my singing, I would. Did you, there's a wonderful song that we just saw two days ago. My sons sent to me of a a woman who was who, who was whose whose song was about how um, I can't I tr I can't have an apartment on the first floor. I don't want to wear certain clothing. I don't like going on the subways at night. And she went through this litany of what women have had to do in order to keep themselves safe. And then the, 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 the chorus was, but you're having a hard time. You know, you, you men are having a hard time. I mean, it's a, it, it, you know, I mean, it's, it's so out of proportion to any concern. I was part, I'm concerned about due process. I certainly am concerned about due process um, and the fairness of accusations. But, um, that those, but to suggest that that, um, that that in any way disadvantages, that the Me Too movement has disadvantaged young men from one end of the country to other is preposterous. I mean, for the most part, the, the men who have suffered the most, um, your own example here is an exception, have, uh, I mean, I have, I shouldn't say an exception, I mean, Al Franken is a different case, have been high profile men um, uh, who've done it for a very long time, multiple accusations. Um, uh, with, the, where, with a lower profile woman making the accusations who had no place else to go, who had no other recourse. Weinstein is that, all of the, you know, the publicist Louis C.K. is like that, had no, there was no recourse. And I, and I dare say Kavanaugh was the same way. The, the notion that a woman would not um, complain made perfect sense to me. I mean, that was, He's younger than I am, but that was my ear. You never would have complained. You were embarrassed. You wouldn't have told anyone. Um, so it, it's, um, um, you know, the, the, the notion that that unique set of facts is trickling down to, you know, my sons, one's 30 and one's 32, just is idiotic. A and is, and is the, the, you know, Trump's effort to delegitimize the Me Too movement, as he has to do because he is so vulnerable. Just saying. You want to add to that, Lisa? It's 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 maddening to me. I mean, and and it's hurtful, you know, as a woman. And it's it's um, in to invalidate people's lived experience like that. And remember, I was talking about his use of the bully pulpit. That's how he uses it to delegitimize women, to to dehumanize black men, in particular NFL players. This is how he uses his 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 position, and quite frankly, I resent it. And 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 and, and it's 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 hurtful because it's a kind of a series of kind of bashing that that happens. That oh my gosh, it it you get to be numbing, and it just it I don't you know, it, and it's hard to fight. How do you push back on that, right? When everyone knows it's completely untrue. But then it's enough to create another movement among similarly situated men in this case, um, and now we have a whole kind of you know him too. body. Uh, yeah, him now too. we have a body of, of research about it, empathy, and you know, kind of this and that, and now it's going to be a thing. The good news is, is that you know, it, if we survive it, if I survive it, y'all will survive it. Um, it'll it'll pass because the the. The, the good news is, is that this, the Me Too movement and women's kind of um, empower, self-empowerment around these issues is what's driving more women to run for office in, in numbers that we haven't seen before and winning, and, and winning on a progressive uh, agenda. So, so that's the good news. And so I think that when we get through it and we get people who, as the judge explained, are not moderates who will say, you know, then maybe we'll see see some difference, and that again is on kind of all of us. It's I can't I can't women can't just push on push back on that by themselves. The men who are elected elected officials, Pence maybe, or maybe you would say maybe you could say something about how disgusting what you just said was. Who's gonna Who's gonna call them out? I mean, it's just, we can't do it.
Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for bringing the focus back to that because I got, got a little distracted. <laughs> it's so upsetting because I can lose sight of what is happening in communities and, and among men. And I want to say especially kind of younger men or kind of older men too who are, who are the first for the, a lot for the first time, for many for the first time, really listening and believing women and becoming, you know, standing kind of side by side and working to dismantle um, these systems. So that is happening. I think, I, I, I know that activism, there's been a revival in, in, in nonviolent activism. It, it hasn't been kind of this engaging since the civil rights movement. So that's true too. And um, so I guess we could just continue to concentrate on us and building our power, you know, as a movement and keep moving, moving it forward community by community and speaking out kind of when, when, when we can um, and marginalizing it in that way, kind of marginalizing the, the administration. I, I just want to say one thing, because it's sort of the judge in me uh, yes. has to sort of... <laughs> Um, and it's that a reasonable is, one. Right. No, no, I mean, I, I, I think, um, uh, I think women have to, have to say and say categorically uh, that the Me Too movement was saying themes that we've all experienced. Uh, there's no question, saying things that we've all experienced, no question about that. Saying that the, the concept that women lie about these things is a preposterous shibboleth. Some may, d some certainly do, but the notion that that was uh, the prevalent concept led to all sorts of protections for men over the years. And so that's the second thing. These things happen. The second thing is that women, there may be women, some women who are lying, but that for the most part, these were honest stories. The third thing is that we should be concerned about due process. We should be concerned about the fairness in the accusation. There's no question about that. And you can say those things in the same sentence, uh, you know, without without diluting the position. Uh, you, you, you can be concerned about fairness, not because women regularly lie and we got to sort of flesh it out, but because sometimes there can be false accusations. We want to make sure that people are protected and it's not in women's interest to have false accusations. Kavanaugh, just getting back to that, <laughs> not to be able to, uh, um, I was initially troubled when I heard about the accusations against him that were, you know, n numbers of years old. Then I began to realize that when I applied for a judgeship, I had to disclose on my application, it, there, was a, there was literally a sentence that said, have you ever experimented with illegal drugs? When and which drug? And I was supposed to write down, uh, the statute of limitations had passed, I was supposed to write down, you know, was it marijuana, was it cocaine, was it this? By the time I got on the bench, marijuana was okay because Bill Clinton said he hadn't inhaled. So I wrote down, I didn't inhale either. We all knew it, <laughs> right, it was fine. If you wrote down Coke or anything stronger, it didn't matter whether it was high school, college, or you know, law school, it was a disqualifying answer. And so it occurred to me that, that applying for a judgeship is a different, it's not a criminal charge, it's not losing a job, it, it is essentially, it's a different enterprise. And if, there, if all of us had to answer questions about illegal drug use, he should have to answer questions of attempted rape. And there was nothing wrong with that. But, you know, but I think, but, but context matters. So, um, you know, you, you, we should pause and say, what do we think about accusations that are that old? And it certainly is difficult to defend yourself against them. There's no question about that. Although it seemed clear by the end of the proceeding that what he should have done was to say, I had trouble with alcohol in high school, college, and law school. I don't remember many times what I did. I can't imagine I would have done something like that, but I am profoundly apologetic if I did. And I believe that that would have dignified, ma dignified her claims and it, and it would have been probably the honest response. Mm -hmm. Probably the honest response. But that he didn't do that and said, I never drink, it categorically didn't happen, I was a choir boy, that, that's troubling. But I, I have no opinions about Justice Kavanaugh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I see hands. The, the light is in my eyes, and I, I know a lot of you who are here, and if I don't say your name, please say it, because I, I can't really see faces. You had to identify yourself before I see your faces. So, yes, in the back. All right.
Es esto. And it was a version of the question you asked this morning, too. I mean, I, the, the, um, peop, there, there have been very creative solutions, not solutions, approaches to domestic violence. That is to say, family courts mm -hmm. that have one criminal charges here, custody issues, uh, sort of adolescence, uh, juvenile, you know, juvenile court as well, recognizing that it's, a ins that it's an institutional problem, that sending him away for a long time may not be what the best thing for the family, may not be the best thing for the children, and trying to recognize that it is a complicated problem. And that may be what we need to look at in general, which is to say, and we, I said this is my answer to you this morning, which is if we tell victims of all kinds that they will get closure if this guy gets the maximum sentence. We have told them that. It's not clear to me that, uh, you know, as an a priori matter, psychologically, that that's true. Maybe we can work together about what are other ways of getting closure. What if I told you that if he went away for a long time, I'm not talking about domestic violence, but if he went away for a long time, he will come out worse. You know, that in prison is not rehabilitated. Um, uh, I mean, let that be part of the discussion so that, um, so, so that victims know that, I mean, imprisonment is not, doesn't work for most crimes. Um, but I think that I think we have to look at creative solutions. I wanted to go back to the family court issue, in which vic victims of domestic violence, you know, y when I say they buy into that, you have to be careful because sometimes they will buy into things that are not in their interest. But at least it enables a broader discussion. I don't think that you should give up on the Parkland movement. I think part of the problem with this president is that every week there is another crisis. So things get pushed off the front page, not because they aren't important or people are engaged, not engaged with him, because they get pushed off the front page because he's done something else, re you know, retarded or that's not a great word. <laughs> Forgive me, I just it just came out. Um, uh, you know what I mean? He, so I. I, I think that the issue will be in the November elections. Will this figure in the November elections? Will people, you know, how, how can you campaign so people can recall what happened, uh, you know, then? But I, I, it, it doesn't, it's not clear to me that pushing it off the front pages means that it is not, it, it's not past the tipping point. It's only because there's so much to be indignant about. I agree, and yeah. it, it's still a very present issue in Florida, in the Florida campaign, especially in uh, Andrew Gillum's campaign. He's he's uh, he's um, campaigning on that proactively, and the Parkland students have been on an extended tour across the country, going to high schools and colleges, and they are still out there. Whether the media pays attention right. to it or not, it's important to to follow, acknowledge, and continue to push forward the work that the people are doing on the ground because. We're just, you're just not always going to kind of pay attention unless something, something else happens. That, that's, that's our media. I, I'd actually like to ask Isha to kind of expand a little bit because your question made me also think of a sort of activism triage. Mm -hmm. You know, how does your center prioritize all of the catastrophes that we're, <laughs> that we're facing all at once? Um, I, is it what, what bubbles up to you as, as a law case? Is it a particular outrage that's brought to your attention that has 
a particular individual or group. You know, how does how does well, how does you do you do you do long term kind of strategy planning and focus areas, and then if if it changes, you have to be um, adaptive and you have to be kind of willing to to look at that issue and in, in it through another lens. For instance, the the gun violence issue. That's not one of our priority issues at all. However, when they came through Montgomery and wanted to talk to us, it we really saw it as a as a school issue. And and we're trying to create safe and inclusive schools for students. And oh my gosh, well maybe, you know, doing something on this gun violence issue will help move the needle on that. We may not adopt it as a full on focus for our practice, but we do what we can to help push it forward with, with a, an allied organization or the, the organizers who are doing, who are conducting the thing. It, everything doesn't have to come through us, right. right? So we should be able to kind of support movements that pop up orga organically. And I think more importantly, listen to community folks um, in terms of what issues they say need to be addressed. Because what happens in, you know, with policy heads is, is that, you know, they think they know and have, have, have little um, connection to people actually living in, living lives in those communities that are affected. Well, just be before that you call on someone, this is a plug for what you do, Elaine. Um, and that is, uh, it is helpful to look at our at history, not just 1968, mm -hmm. which is what you're talking about now, but um, during the McCarthy uh, times when, when the courts were singularly absent while people were being wrongly accused of being communists, while there were purges, while there was this, this totally uh, bogus investigation in Congress about who was a communist and who was not. The system, after there was people that were hurt, but the system corrected itself. Um, uh, uh, you know, there were lawyers who basically kept on saying, have you no, you know, what is it? What was have it? you no shame. Have you no shame. Um, there were, there were uh, newspapers that, you know, the system corrected itself. And in one sense, I find a certain amount of solace in looking at historical records when you, th when you thought the country had hit a low and how we, how we crawled out of that low. And I, that's what helps me now. I'm sorry. Interrupt. No, no, no. That's true. We, yeah. and we have to be the ones that are crawling out. It just doesn't happen. Right. right? And that's so right. That's what I want to encourage you all is that that's not going to happen magically because we're the U.S. It happens because you make it happen. Right. Yeah. You mean whether legislation will change people's minds? Yeah. The system is a system. You can't pass legislation without mobilizing people to understand why that legislation was passed. I would even say that of litigation. The, the, it, there are many who believe that the, the, the battle for choice was, was lost once it seemed won in the courts, mm -hmm. and therefore the movement dissolved. Mm -hmm. So I think the answer is, you have to operate on multiple levels. You, you know, we, we have, you have to basically mobilize at multiple levels. People have to understand what they're legislating, and people have to, and even Supreme Court decisions, the LBGT issue, TQ issue is a classic example. There, that decision can't protect rights, um, particularly not with this Supreme Court. It can't protect rights. People will protect rights. Movements will protect rights. That's how it'll happen. And important legislation helps change hearts and minds. I mean, we saw it with the marriage equality decision. Right. We saw it with the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Certainly, I don't know, I, I, I'd venture to guess maybe a third, maybe a half of the country was on board, and hearts and minds were changed over time. So sometimes you do have to Lead. create right. the equity and then bring, then bring folks along. This is. That's, that's, I think, exactly what happened with marriage equality, because it happened so quickly. 
right? And it happened because more because young people were kind of moving it along, and older people were like, what, what, uh, who, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and then and the, the 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 sensitivity around trans issues too, I think, really happened really quickly. That's the one that I think is is great is at greater risk because kind of looking at L LGB issues were were have been present for some time, but people were just kind of coming along on this T issue, and we were getting there, and now that can be totally. Well, as you can see, the bathroom bills are are disappearing, and kids are being bullied again in school. You know, and kids are committing suicide again already. So, because we want to prevent that. I am willing to pass legislation first and then move hearts and minds along later if it protects people from you know, harm. Well, I think, I, I know, I watched a press conference, didn't really mean to, but I happened to, I happened to see some of it. And um, the, one of the reporters was asking Sarah, what's her name, the communications. Huckabee? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, what about, so the president now believes that people should be um, proven, you know, given the benefit of the doubt, and they're innocent and should be proven guilty, and what about Central Park Five? Right, and she just went completely over it. Another um, uh, reporter picked it up, and so I think that if we keep, th there is an opportunity to kind of raise up those stories and remind folks that no, not all you know, n not all men are are at risk, and not certainly not all people are assumed um, innocent until proven until proven guilty. So it's our it's our responsibility to to raise up those narratives. Um, I know that I try to do it with, with respect to the, like this NFL thing is is just a real not even a pet peeve. I tell people, and, and it's true. I think it was like the most hurtful thing that I think I allowed myself to experience. Like the president of the United States is in Alabama, you know, saying calling black men sons of bitches, and I just like, whoa! It was like that's just it. That's just like you really don't care. And the fact that he's like said similar things and, re and is happy to repeat them for this past year, and anyone would think, I mean, you want to pull Kanye out, you know, <laughs> it's it's maddening. It's maddening. It's just it's just blatant disrespect. So, um, just kind of raise up raise up those again when when we're having conversations, political conversations with folks about the state of whatever. It's up to us to kind of raise those counter narratives so that so that it's a fuller exploration of what's going on. Yes, I was about to be a Cosby apologist, and I don't want to be, and I and I don't apologize for him at all. I I will simply point out that that the first one down in, in with Me Too and convicted and going seeing jail time is black. I'll just say, <laughs> yeah, he should be there. Period. What's that? Yes. Well, I mean, you're absolutely right. I think there's extremes on both sides. I mean, there's extreme right, and then there's an extreme left. The po we're, there's more kind of distance between us than ever. 
what, when you were talking about the, the center, or the moral center, I thought of William Barber. And I think that he's the only person out there, if you all don't know who Reverend Barber is, he just won a Genius Award, so maybe, maybe you heard that. Um, he started the, the Moral Monday movement mm -hmm. in um, North Carolina, North Carolina yeah. and is now is revived within the first year of reviving the Poor People's Campaign. And he does great intersectional work, and it's all about the moral imperative, right? That there's a moral imperative to, to end racism, to end poverty, to, to have more humane immigration practices. It's very intersectional and LGBT. It's, it just picks up everything. And he makes me kind of very hopeful in terms of um, organizing. And if more people kind of knew about it and joined this campaign, it could, it could be, you know, um, on the scale of, of the civil rights movement in the, in the 50s and 60s if we got, if we got behind it. He's also anti-militarization too. William Barber. He comes from a re religious tradition, and he's you know he's a, he's a believer, and he's also really very cool with with agnostics and atheists. He's he's amazing. <laughs> huh? Oh, he just. Oh my gosh! If you ever get an opportunity to see him, you'll believe in church. Uh -huh. I'm so glad you asked. Nancy, what do you think? Well, I mean, his, 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 his accusation is that they have discriminated against him because of his race or because of his political activity. They've there's been collusion right. in terms of keeping him out of the NFL and that, that all of the owners got together right. and said we would not hire right. this but, guy. But not because he's black, just because he refuses to, to stand up. I mean, uh, it's hard to say. On the one hand, it's expressive speech, Trump notwithstanding. Mm -hmm. It should be protected by the First Amendment. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't be a basis uh, for uh, not hiring. Um, on the other hand, um, the uh, sports figures and entertainers have different rules with respect to them about how they behave on court or off court. It will take... I mean, I don't know is the, is the answer. I think it's important. The other side of the coin is it's terribly important sometimes to bring litigation, mm -hmm. even if you lose. Uh, and that's because we're such a litigious society. We oftentimes, issues become crystallized because we've laid them out in court. Mm -hmm. So bringing that, laying that evidence out is terribly important whether he wins uh, or not. But I think, I mean, I think winning, it's just complicated. I don't know enough about it, but because he is entertainer slash sports figure, it's, it's not clear where the rules are. Um, but I mean, I think I, I do want to make sure that we end, as we have this morning, um, that um, the answer is you have to do something. The answer is that everyone has to do something. The something, the end of that sentence could be, you know, um, uh, mobilize, demonstrate, write opinion pieces, call your congress. It, I don't care what the end of that sentence is, as long as people understand they have to do something. Um, the significance of Kavanaugh on the Supreme Court now is, and this is a personal comment, literally all of the litigation that I was involved in, my husband was involved in, uh, uh, many of people my age were involved in from 1968 until now is at risk. Mm. All of those rights are at risk. Um, and, and then, as I said, a whole bunch more. So the an we have to, everyone has to do something. There's no, and everyone has to vote at the very oh minimum. Right. There is not an issue. <laughs> there, this is not an election. or th th There has never been an election that anyone should sit out of, and it surely is not this.